good wishes to all of you history of medieval india by satish chandra sir chapter 7 the delhi sultanate to circa 1300 to 1400 audio book the kaljis and the tughlaqs after the death of balban in 1286 there was again confusion confusion in delhi for some time balban's chosen successor prince mohammed and uh, had died earlier in a battle with the mongols a second son Bugra Khan preferred to rule over Bengal and Bihar although he was invited by the nobles at Delhi to assume the throne hence a grandson of Balban was installed in Delhi but he was too young and inexperienced to cope with the situation there had been a good deal of resentment and opposition at the attempt of the turkish nobles to monopolize high offices Many known talks such as the Kaljis had come to India at the time of the Gurid invasion they had never received sufficient recognition in Delhi and had to move to Bengal and Bihar for an opportunity for advancement they had also found employment as soldiers many of them being posted in the northwest to meet the Mongol challenge in course of time many indian muslims had been admitted to the nobility they also were dissatisfied at being denied high offices as may be inf- inferred from the manner in which i one madhun rahin was put up against balban balban own example of setting aside the sons of nasiruddin muhammad had demonstrated that a successful general could ascend the throne by out- ousting the scunds of the in establishment established dynasty provided he had sufficient support in the nobility and the army the kaljis 1292 1320 for this reason for these reasons a group of kalji nobles led by jalaluddin kalji who had been the warden of the marches in the northwest and had fought many successful engagements against the mongols overthrew the incumbent successors of balban in 1290 The Kalji rebellion was welcomed to by, welcomed by the non-Turkish sections in the nobility the Kaljis who were of a mixer Turkish Afghan origin did not exclude the Turks from high offices but the rise of the Kaljis to power ended the Turkish monopoly of high offices Jalaluddin Kalji ruled only for a brief period of 6 years he tried to mitigate some of the harsh aspects of Balban's rule He was the first ruler of the Delhi Sultanate to clearly put forward the view that the state should be based on the willing support of the governed and that uh, since the large majority of the people in India were Hindus the state in India could be could not be a truly Islamic state He also tried to gain the goodwill of the nobility by a policy of tolerance and avoiding harsh punishments however many people including his supporters considered his a considered this a weak policy which was not suited to the times the delhi sultanate faced numerous internal and external foes and for this reason there was a sense of insecurity jalaluddin's policy was reversed by alaluddin who awarded drastic punishments to all those who dared to oppose him alaluddin kalji uh, 1296 to 1316 came to the throne by treacherously murdering his uncle and father-in-law jalaluddin kalji as the governor of awadh alaluddin had accumulated a vast reserve by invading deogir in the deccan jalaluddin had gone to visit his nephew at kara in the hope of getting hold of this treasure he had left most of his army behind and had crossed the river gangas with only a few followers so that his nephew might not take fright and run away after murdering his uncle alaluddin won over most of the nobles and soldiers to his side by lavish use of gold but for some time alaluddin had to face a series of rebellions some by disgruntled nobles and some by alaluddin's own relations to overrun over his opponents alaluddin kilji adopted measures of utmost severity and ruthlessness most of the nobles who had defeated to him by the lure of gold were either killed or dismissed and their properties confiscated 
severe punishments were given to the rebellious members of his own family he resorted to a wholesale massacre of the mongols a couple of thousand of them having settled down in delhi after embracing islam in the time of jalaluddin this new converts had rebelled demanding a large share in a loot in gujarat having campaigning there alauddin gave harsh punishments even to the wives and children of these rebels a practice which according to the historian bharani uh, was a new one that was continued by his successors alauddin framed a series of regulations to prevent the nobles from conspiring against him they were forbidden to hold banquets or festival festivities or to form marriage alliances without the permission of the sultan to discourage festive parties he banned the use of wines and intoxicants he also instituted a spy service to inform the sultan of all that the noble said and did by these harsh methods alauddin khilji cowed down the nobles and made them completely subservient to the crown no further rebellions took place during his lifetime but in the long run his methods proved harmful to the dynasty the old nobility was destroyed and the new nobility was taught to accept any one who could ascend the throne of delhi this became apparent from alauddin khilji's death in 1316 his favorite malik kafur malik kafur raised a minor son of alauddin to the throne and imprisoned or blinded his other sons without encountering any opposition from the nobles soon after this kafur was killed by the palace guards and a hindu covered convert kusra ascended the throne although the historians of the time accuse kusra of violating islam and of committing all types of crimes the fact is that is that kusra was not worse than any of the preceding monarchs nor was any open resentment voiced against him by the muslim nobles or by the population of delhi even nizamuddin auliya the famous sufi saint of delhi acknowledged kusra by accepting his gifts this had a positive aspect too it showed that the muslims of delhi and the neighboring areas were no longer swayed by racist considerations and were prepared to obey anyone irrespective of his family or racial background this helped in broadening the social base of the nobility still further however in 1320 a group of officers led by jayasuddin tughlaq raised the banner of revolt they broke out into open rebellion and in a hard fought battle outside the capital kusra was defeated and killed the tughlaqs 1322 1412 jayasuddin tughlaq established a new dynasty which ruled till 1412 the tughlaqs provided three component rulers jayasuddin his son muhammad bin tughlaq 1324-51 and his nephew Firoz Shah Tughlaq 1351-88 the first two of these sultans ruled over an empire with a comprised almost the entire country the empire of firoz was smaller but even so it was the almost as large as that ruled over by alauddin khilji after the death of firoz the delhi sultanate disintegrated and north india was divided into a series of small states Although the Tughlaqs continued to rule till 1412, the invasion of Delhi by Timur in 1398 may be said to mark the end of the Tughlaq Empire. We shall first examine the remarkable expansion of the Delhi Sultanate from the time of Alauddin Khilji, then the various internal reforms in the Sultanate during the period, and the factors which led to the disintegration of the Sultanate. Expansion of the Delhi Sultanate. We have seen. how eastern rajasthan including azmer and some of its neighboring territories had come under the control of the delhi sultanate so from the time of balban rantambore which was the most powerful rajput state had gone out of its control jalaluddin had undertaken an invasion of rantambore but found the task too difficult for him thus southern and western rajasthan had remained outside the control of the sultanate with the rise to power of alauddin khilji a new situation developed within a space of 25 years the armies of the delhi sultanate not only brought gujarat and malwa under their control and subjugated most of the princes in rajasthan but they also overran the deccan and south india up to madurai 
In due course, an attempt was made to bring this vast area under the direct administrative control of Delhi. The new phase of expansion was initiated by Alauddin Khilji and was continued under his successors, the climax being reached during the reign of Muhammad bin Tughlaq. We have already seen how the Delhi Sultanate was gradually geared up for this renewed phase of expansion. At this time, Malwa, Gujarat and Deoghir were being ruled by Rajput dynasties, most of which had come into existence towards the end of the 12th and the beginning of the 13th century, despite the establishment of Turkish rule in the Ganga Valley. These dynasties had hardly changed their old ways. Moreover, each one of them was contending of contending for mastery over the entire region. So much so that when under Iltutmish, the Turks attacked Gujarat, the rulers of both Malwa and Deoghir attacked it from the south. In the Martha region, the rulers of Deoghir were constantly at war with Varangal in the Telangana region and with the Hoysalas in the Karnataka area. The Hoysalas in turn were at war with their neighbors, the Pandyas in Mabhar, Tamil area. These rivalries not only made the conquest of Malwa and Gujarat easier but tended to draw an invader further and further into the south. The Turkish rulers had strong reasons for coveting, coveting Malwa and Gujarat. Not only were these areas fertile and populous, but they also controlled the western seaports and the trade routes connecting them with the Ganga Valley. The overseas trade from Gujarat ports brought in a lot of gold and silver, which had been accumulated by the rulers of the area. Another reason for the Sultanates of Delhi to establish their rule over Gujarat was that it could secure them a better control over the supply of horses to their armies. With the rise of the Mongols in Central and West Asia and their struggle with the rulers of Delhi, the supply of horses of good quality to Delhi from this region had been beset with difficulties. The import of Arabi, Iraqi and Turkey horses to India from the western seaports had been an important item of trade since the 8th century. Early in 1299, an army under two of Alauddin Khilji's noted generals marched against Gujarat by way of Rajasthan. On their way, they raided and captured Jaisalmer also. The Gujarat ruler Rai Karan was taken by surprise and fled without offering a fight. The chief cities of Gujarat, including Anihilawar, where many beautiful buildings and temples had been built over generations were sacred. The famous temple of Somnath, which had been rebuilt in the 12th century, was also plundered and sacked. An enormous booty was collected, nor were the wealthy Muslim merchants of Kambe spared. It was here that Malik Kafur, who later led the invasion of South India, was captured. He was presented to Alauddin and soon rose in his estimation. Gujarat now passed under the control of Delhi. The rapidity and ease with which Gujarat was conquered suggests that the Gujarat ruler was not popular among his subjects. It appears that one of his ministers who had fallen out with him had approached Alauddin to invade Gujarat and had helped him. The Gujarat army may not have been well trained and the administration was probably lax. With the help of Ramachandra, the ruler of Diogar, the outside ruler Rai Karan managed to hold on to a portion of South Gujarat. As we shall see, this provided an additional cause of war between Delhi and the Yadavas of Diogar. Rajasthan After the conquest of Gujarat, Alauddin turned his attention to the consolidation of his rule over Rajasthan. The first to invite his attention was Rantambur, which was being ruled by the Chauhan successors of Prathviras. Its ruler, Hamir Deva, had embarked on a series of warlike expeditions against his neighbors. He is credited with having won victories against Raja Bhoj of Dar and the Rana of Mewar. But it was these victories which pro proved to be his undoing. After the Gujarat campaign, on their way back to Delhi, the Mongol soldiers rebelled following a dispute regarding the share of the booty. The rebellion was crushed and a wholesale massacre followed. 
two of the Mongol nobles fled for refuse to Rantambur. Alauddin sent messages to Hamir Deva to kill or expel the Mongol nobles. But Hamir Deva, with a high sense of dignity and obligation to those who had sought refuse with him, and being confident of the strength of his fort and his armies, sent haughty replies. He was not far wrong in his estimation, for Rantambur was reputed to be the strongest fort in Rajasthan and had earlier defied, defied Jalaluddin Kilji. Alauddin dispatched an army commanded by one of his reputed generals. But it was repulsed with the losses by Hamir Deva. Finally, Alauddin himself had to march against Rantambur. The famous poet Amir Kusru, who went along with Alauddin, has given a graphic description of the fort and its investment. After three months of closes, the fearful Jahur ceremony took place. The woman Johar ceremony took place. The woman mounted the funeral pair and all the men came out to fight to the last. This is the first description we have of the Johar in Persian. All the Mongols too died fighting with the Rajputs. These event took place in 1301. Alauddin next turned his attention towards Chittor, which after Rantambur was the most powerful state in Rajasthan. It was therefore necessary for Alauddin to subdue it. Apart from this, its ruler Ratan Singh had annoyed him by refusing permission to his armies to march to Gujarat through Mevar territories. Chittor also dominated the route from Azmir to Malwa. There is a popular legend that Alauddin attacked Chittor, Chittor because he coveted Padmini, the beautiful queen of Ratan Singh. Many modern historians do not accept this legend because it is mentioned for the first time more than 100 years later. It was embellished later by a Hindi poet Malik Muhammad Jaisi. In the story, Padmini is the princess of Singal Dvipa and Ratan Singh crosses the seven seas to reach her and brings her back to Chitor after many adventures that appear improbable. The Padmini lesson is a part of his account. That the Sultan could have demanded to see the face of a queen who was a wife of another ruler is also as unthinkable as the idea that the proud Rana would have agreed to show her even through a mirror. Such a suggestion would have been an insult to the Rajput sense of a honor for which they willingly sacrificed their lives. Alauddin closely invested Chitor after a valiant resistance by the besieger for several months, Alauddin stormed at the fort. 1303, the Rajputs performed Jahar and most of the warriors died fighting. Padmini and the other queens also sacrificed their lives. But it seems uh, that Ratan Singh was captured alive and kept a prisoner for some time. Chitur was assigned to Alauddin's minor son, Kirskan, and a Muslim garrison was posted in the fort. After some time, its change was handed over to a cousin of Ratan Singh. Alauddin also overran Jalur, which lay on the route to Gujarat. Almost all the other major states in Rajasthan were forced to submit. However, it seems that Alauddin did not try to establish direct administration over the Rajput states. The Rajput rulers were endeavored to rule but had to pay regular tribute and to obey the orders of the Sultan. Muslim garrisons were posted in some of the important towns such as Azmir, Nagur, etc. This Rajasthan was thoroughly subdued. Deccan and South India. Even before completing the subjugation of Rajasthan, Alauddin had conquered Malwa, which says Amir Kusru was so extensive that even wise geographers were unable to delimit its frontiers. Unlike Rajasthan, Malwa was brought under direct administration and a Governor was appointed to look after it. In 1306 to 1307, Alauddin planned two campaigns. The first was against Rai Karan, who, after his ex expulsion from Gujarat, had been holding Baglana on the border of Malwa. 
Rai Karan fought up bravely, but he could not resist for long. The second expedition was aimed against Rai Ramchandra, the ruler of Deogil, uh, who had been in alliance with Rai Karan. In an earlier campaign, Rai Ramchandra had agreed to pay early tribute to Delhi. This had fallen into errors. The command of the second army was entrusted to Alauddin slave Malik Kafur. Rai Ramchandra, who surrendered to Kapur, uh, Kapur was honorably treated and carried to Delhi, where after some time he was restored to this uh, dominance with the title of uh, Rai, Ra Rai Ra Ryan. Sorry, Rai Ryan. A gift of one lakh tankas was given to him along with a golden colored canopy, which was a symbol of rulership. He was also given a district of Gujarat. One of his doctors was married to Alauddin. The alliance with Rai Ramchandra was to prove to be of great value to Alauddin in his further aggrandizement in the Deccan. Between 1309 and 1311, Malik Kafur led two campaigns in South India, the first against Varangal in the Telangana area and the other against Dwar Samudra, modern Karnataka, Mabar and Madurai, Tamil Nadu. A great deal has been written about these expeditions partly because they struck the imagination of the contemporaries. The court poet Amir Khosru made them the subject of a book. These campaigns reflected boldness, self-confidence and a high spirit of adventure on the part of the Delhi rulers. For the first time, Muslim armies penetrated as far south as Madurai and brought back untold wealth. They provided first-hand information about conditions in the south, though they hardly provided any fresh geographical knowledge. The trade routes to South India were well known and when Kafur's armies reached Virachala in Mabal, they found a colony of Muslim merchants settled there. The ruler even had a contingent of Muslim troops in his army. These expeditions greatly raised Kafur in public estimation and Allah Wuthin appointed him Malik Naib or Vice Regent of the Empire. Politically, however, the effects of these campaigns were limited. Kafur was able to force the rulers of Varangal and Dwar Samudra to sue for peace, to surrender all their treasures and elephants, and to promise an annual tribute. But it was well known that to secure these tributes, an annual campaign would be needed. In the case of Mabar, even this formal agreement was not forthcoming. The rulers there had avoided a pitched battle. Kafur had plundered as much as he could including a number of wealthy temples such as those at Chidambaram, but he had to return to Delhi without being able to defeat the Tamil armies. Despite the troubles following the death of Alauddin, within a decade and a half of his death, all the southern kingdoms mentioned above were wiped out and their territories brought under the direct administration of Delhi. Alauddin himself was not in favor of direct administration of the southern states. However, the change in, the, in this uh, policy had begun in his own lifetime. In 1315, Rai Ramachandra, who had remained steadily loyal to Delhi, died and his sons threw off, his, threw off the yoke of Delhi. Malik Kafur quickly came and crushed the rebellion and assumed direct administration of the area. However, many outlying areas declared themselves independent, while a few remained under the control of the descendants of the Rai. On the succeeding to the throne, Mubarak Shah, a successor of Alauddin, subdued Yogur again and installed a Muslim governor there. He also raided Varangal and compelled the ruler to cede one of his direct districts and pay an annual tribute of 40 gold bricks. Kusru Khan, a slave of the Sultan, made a plundering raid into Mabar and sacked the rich city of Masli Patanam. No conquests were made in the area. Following the accession of Jiyasuddin to Gluck in 1320, a sustained and vigorous forward policy was embarked upon. 
the sultan's son mohammed bin tughlaq was posted to deogar for the purpose of the excuse that the ruler of warangal had not paid the stipulated tribute mohammed bin tughlaq besieged warangal again at first he suffered a reversal following a rumor of the sultan's death in delhi the delhi armies were disorganized and the defenders fell upon them inflicting heavy losses mohammed bin tughlaq had to retreat, retreat to deogar after reorganizing his armies he attacked again and this time no quarter was given to the rai this was followed by the conquest of mabal which was also annexed mohammed bin tughlaq then raided orissa and returned to delhi with the rich plunder next year he subdued bengal which had been independent since the death of balwan thus by 1324 the territories of the delhi sultan sultanate reached up to madurai the last hindu principality in the area kampili in south karnataka was annexed in 1328 a cousin of mohammed bin tughlaq who had rebelled had been given shelter there thus providing a convenient excuse for attacking it the sudden expansion of the delhi sultanate to the far south and to east including orissa creates a tremendous administrative and financial problems which had to be faced by mohammed bin tughlaq we shall now turn to a study of the manner in which he tried to cope with these problems and the strains which it imposed on the sultanate itself internal reforms and experiments by the time alauddin khilji came to the throne the position of the delhi sultanate was fairly well consolidated in the central portion of the empire that is the portion comprising the upper ganga valley and eastern rajasthan this emboldened the sultans to undertake a series of internal reforms and experiments aimed at improving the administration strengthening the army gearing up the machinery of land revenue administration taking steps to expand and improve cultivation and providing for the welfare of the citizens in the rapidly expanding towns not all the measures were successful but they mark important new departures some of the experiments failed on account of lack of experience some because they were not well conceived or on account of opposition from vested interests they do however show that the turkish state had now acquired a measure of stability and that it was no longer concerned merely with warfare and law and order market control and agrarian policy of alauddin for contemporaries alauddin's measures to control the markets was one of the great wonders of the world in a series of orders after his return from the chitor campaign Alauddin sought to fix the cost of all commodities from food grains sugar and cooking oil to a needle and from costly imported cloth to horses cattle and slave boys and girls for the purpose he set up three markets at delhi or one market for food grains the second for costly cloth and the third for horses slaves and cattle each market was under the control of a high officer called Shahna who maintained a register of the merchants and strictly controlled the shopkeepers and the prices regulation of prices especially food grains was a constant concern of medieval rulers because without the supply of cheap food grains to the towns they could ho- not hope to enjoy the support of the citizens and the army stationed there but alauddin had some additional reasons for controlling the market the mongol invasions of delhi had been pointed the need to raise a large army to check them but such an army would soon exhaust his treasures treasures unless he could lower the prices and hence lower their salaries to realize his objects objectives allah would then proceed in a characteristically throw a throw away in order to ensure a regular supply of chief chief food grains he declared that the land revenue in the dob region that is the area extending from meerut near the yamuna to the border of kara near alhabad would be paid directly to the state that is the villages in the area would not be assigned in ikta to anyone 
Further, the land revenue was raised to half of the produce. This was a heavy charge and Alauddin adopted a number of measures, which, which we shall note later, to cope with the situation by raising the state demand and generally obliging the peasants to pay it in cash. The peasants were forced to sell their food grains at a low price to Banjaras who were to carry them to the towns and to sell them at prices fixed by the state. To ensure that there was no hurting, all the Banjaras were registered and their agents and families were held collectively responsible for any violations. As a further check, the state itself set up a warehouses and stocked them with food grains which were released whenever there was a famine or a threat of a shortfall in supply. Alauddin kept himself constantly informed of everything and very harsh punishment was given if any shopkeeper charged a higher price or tried to cheat by using false weights and measures. measures. Barone tells us that prices were not allowed to be increased by a dam or a paisa even during the time of famine. Thus, wheat sold at a seven and a half jitals a month, barley at a four jitals, good quality rice at five jitals. Burnley says the performance of prices in the grain market was a wonder of the age. Control of the prices of horses was important for the Sultan because without the supply of good horses at reasonable prices to the army, the efficiency of the army could not be maintained. The supply of horses had improved as a result of the conquest of Gujarat. Good quality horses could be sold only to the state. The price of a first grade horse fixed by Alauddin was 100 to 120 tankas, while a tattoo pony not fit for the army cost 10 to 25 tankas. The prices of cattle as well as of slaves were strictly regulated and Bharani gives us their prices in detail. The prices of cattle and slaves are mentioned side by side by Bharani. This shows that slavery was accepted in medieval India as a normal feature. Control of the price, prices of other goods, especially of costly cloth, perfumes, etc. was not vital for the Sultan. However, their prices were also fixed, probably because it was felt that a high prices in this sector would affect prices in general, or it might have been done in order to please the nobility. We are told that large sums of money were advanced to the Multhani traders for bringing fine quality cloth to Delhi from various parts of the country. As a result, Delhi became the biggest market for fine cloth, the price of which was fixed, and traders from all places flocked to Delhi in order to buy it and sell it at a higher price elsewhere. Realization of land revenue in cash enabled Alauddin to pay his soldiers in cash. He was the first sultan in the sultanate to do so. A sour cavalryman in, the, in, in his time was paid to 30 tankas a year or about 20 tankas a month. It appears that he was accepted to maintain himself and his horse and his equipment out of this amount. Even then, this was not a low salary for during Akbar's time. When prices were far higher, a Mughal cavalryman received a salary of about 20 rupees a month. Actually, a Turkish cavalryman during the 13th and 14th centuries was almost a gentleman and accepted a salary which would enable him to live as such. In view of this, the salary fixed by Alauddin was low and the control of the market was therefore necessary. 48 jitals made a tanka. Alauddin's ban was about 15 kg of today. Thus, a citizen of Delhi could buy for the tanka all, a tanka almost equivalent to a silver rupee 96 kg wheat, 144 kg rice, and 180 kg barley. The historians Barani thought that a major objective of Alauddin's control of market markets was his desire to punish the Hindus since most of the traders were Hindus and it was they who rest, uh, resorted to profiteering in food grains and other goods. However, most of the overland trade to West and Central Asia was in the hands of Kursanis who were Muslim as also 
Multanis, many of whom were Muslims, allowed these measures, measures uh, therefore affected these sections also. A fact that Bharati does not mention. It is not clear whether the market regulations of Alauddin were applied only to Delhi or also to other towns in the empire. Barney tells us that the regulations concerning Delhi always tended to be followed in other towns as well. In any case, the army was stationed not only in Delhi but in other towns as well. However, we do not have sufficient information to be certain in the matter. It is clear that while the merchants, Hindus and Muslims might have a com complaint against the price control, not only the army but all citizens irrespective of their religious beliefs benefited from the cheapness of food grains and other articles. Agrarian Reforms Apart from control of the market, Alauddin took important steps in the field of land revenue administration. He was the first monarch in the Sultanate, Sultanate who insisted that in the dome, land revenue would be assessed on the basis of measuring the land under cultivation. This implied that the rich and the powerful in the villages who had more land could not pass on their burden to the poor. Alauddin wanted that the landlords of the area called Kuts and Mukadhams should pay the same taxes as the others. Thus, they had to pay taxes on milch cattle and houses like the others and forgo other illegal cesses which they were in the habit of realizing. In the picture square language of Burmi, the Kuts and Mukadhams could not afford to ride on rich caprician horses or to chew petal leaves and they became so poor that their wives had to go and work in the houses of Muslims. The policy of direct collection of land revenue by the state based on measurement could only succeed if the Amils and other local officials were honest. Although Alauddin had given these elements sufficient salaries to enable them to live in comfort, he instituted that uh, their accounts should be audited strictly. We are told that from that for small defaults, they would be beaten and sent to prison. But this is that their life had become so insecure for them that no one was willing to marry their doctors to them. No doubt this is an exaggeration because they then as now, government service was considered prestigious and those who held government offices. Whether they were Hindus or Muslims were again eagerly sought as marriage partners. Although Barney writes as if all the measures mentioned above were directed solely against the Hindus, it is clear that they were in the main directed against the privileged sections in the countryside. But these can hardly be considered socialistic measures they were basically designed to meet an emergency situation with the danger posed by the Mongols. Perhaps it would have been better for Alauddin to have controlled only the price of essential commodities such as food grains, etc. But as Barney says, he tried to control the price of everything from caps to socks, from combs to needles, vegetables, soups, sweet, sweet meals to chapatis. These led to vexations or laws which were sought to be violated and led to drastic punishments and resentment. Alauddin's agrarian policy was certainly harsh and must have affected the ordinary cultivators also. But it was not so burdensome as to drive them into rebellion or flight. The market regulations of Alauddin came to an end with his death. But it did achieve a number of gains. We are told by Barani that the regulations enabled Alauddin to raise a large and efficient cavalry which enabled him to defeat the subsequent Mongol onslaughts with a great slaughter and to drive them beyond the Indus. The land revenue reforms of Alauddin marked an important step towards closer relationship with the rural areas. Some of his measures were continued by his successors and later provided a basis, basis for the agrarian reforms of Sher Shah and Akbar. Muhammad Tughlaq's experiments Next to Alauddin Khilji, 
Muhammad bin Tughlaq 1324 to 51 is best remembered as a ruler who undertook the undertook a number of bold experiments and showed a keen interest in agriculture. In some ways Muhammad bin Tughlaq was one of the most remarkable rulers of his age. He was deeply read in religion and philosophy and had a critical and open mind. He conversed not only re- only with the Muslim mystics but also with the Hindu yogis and Jain saints such as Jinnah Prabhat Suri. Uh, this was not liked by many orthodox theologians who accused him of being a rationalist, that is, one who was not prepared to accept religious beliefs as a matter of faith. He was also prepared to give high offices to people on the basis of merit, irrespective of whether they belonged to noble families or not. Unfortunately, he was inclined to be hasty and impatient, that is why so many of his experiments failed, and he has been dubbed an in-starred idealist. idealist. Muhammad Tughlaq's reason started under inauspicious circumstances. Sultan Jasuddin Tughlaq was returning to Delhi after a successful campaign against Bengal. A wooden pavilion was erected hastily at the orders of Muhammad Tughlaq to give a fitting reception to the Sultan. When the captured elephants were being padded, the hastily erected structure collapsed and the Sultan was killed. This led to a number of rumors that Muhammad Tughlaq had planned to kill his father, that this was a curse of the heavens and of the famous saint of Delhi, Saik Nizamuddin Aliya. whom the ruler had threatened to punish etc the most controversial step which muhammad tughlaq undertook soon after his accession was the so called transfer of the capital from delhi to deogar as we have seen deogar had been a base for the expansion of turkish rule in south india muhammad tughlaq himself had spent a number of years there as a prince The attempt to bring the entire South India under the direct control of Delhi had led to serious political difficulties. The people of the area were restive under what they felt was an alien rule. A number of Muslim nobles had tra- tried to take advantage of this situation to proclaim their independence there. The most serious rebellion was that of a cousin of Muhammad Tughlaq, Gurshap. against whom the sultan had to proceed personally it appears that the sultan wanted to make deogar a second capital so that he might be able to control south india better for this purpose he ordered many of the officers and their followers and leading men including many sufi saints to shift in shift to deogar which was renamed daultabad it seems that a good deal of official pressure was exerted on these sections to migrate liberal grants were also provided to them and arrangements made for their stay at daultabad no attempt was made to shift the rest of the population delhi remained a large and populous city in the absence of the sultan coins minted in delhi while the sultan was at deogar testify to this So Muhammad Tughlaq had built a road from Delhi to Daultabad and set up rest houses on the way to help the travelers. Daultabad was more than 1500 kilometers away. Many people died due to the rigors of the journey and the heat. Since this movement took place during the summer season, many of those who reached Daultabad felt homesick. For some of them had lived for several generations in Delhi. and looked upon it as their home hence there was a good deal of discontent after a couple of years muhammad tughlaq decided to abandon daultabad largely because he soon found that just as he could not control the south from delhi he could not control north india from daultabad though the attempt to make deogar a second capital failed the exodus did have a number of long term benefits it helped in bringing north and south india closer together by improving communications many people including religious divines who had gone to daultabad settled down there they became the means of spreading in the deccan the cultural religious and social ideas which the turks had brought with them to north india 
This resulted in a new process of cultural interaction between North and South India, as well as in South India itself. Another step which Muhammad Tughlaq took at this time was the introduction of the token currency. Since money is merely a medium of exchange, all countries in the world today have token currencies, generally paper currency, so that they do not have to depend upon the supply of gold and silver. There was a shortage of silver in the world in the 14th century. Moreover, Kobria Khan of China had already successfully experimented with the token currency. A Mongol ruler of Iran, Gajan Khan, had also experimented with it. Muhammad Tughlaq decided to introduce a bronze coin which was to have the same value as the silver tanker. Specimens of this coin have been found in different parts of India and can be seen in museums. The idea of a token currency was a new one in India and it was difficult to induce the traders as well as the common man to accept it. Muhammad Tughlaq might still have been successful if the government had been able to prevent people from forking the new coins. The government was not able to do so. And soon the new coins began to be greatly devalued in the markets. Finally, Muhammad Tughlaq decided to withdraw the token currency. He promised to exchange silver pieces of bronze coins. In this way, many people exchanged the new coins, but the forged coins which could be found out from test were not exchanged. These coins were heaped up outside the four tender burnaces, the reminder lying there for many years. The failure of these two experiments affected the prestige of the subversion and also meant the wastage of money. However, the government quickly recovered. The Moroccan traveller Ibn Batuta, who came to Delhi in 1333, could not see any harmful after effects of these experiments. A far more serious problem with which Muhammad bin Tughlaq had to contend was that of the security of the frontiers administration especially revenue administration and his relations with the nobles also presented some serious problems. We have seen in an earlier section the serious problems posed to the Delhi Sultanate by the steady expansion of Mongol power into the Punjab. Under assaults on Delhi, although the Mongols had by then become weak due to their internal decisions, they were still strong enough to threaten the Punjab and the areas near Delhi. In the early years of Muhammad Tughlaq's region, the Mongols under their leader Tarmashrin burst into Sindh and a force reached up to Meerut. About 65 kilometers from Delhi, Muhammad Tughlaq not only defeated the Mongol in the battle near the Jhelum, but also occupied a Kalanar and for some time his power extended beyond the Indus up to Peshwar. This showed that the Sultan of Delhi was now in a position to go on the offensive against the Mongols. After returning from Diogar, the Sultan recruited a large army in order to occupy Ghazni and Afghanistan. Barney says that his object was to occupy Khorasan and Iraq. We have no means of finding out the true object of Muhammad Tughlaq. Maybe his objective was to re-establish what has been called the scientific frontier with the line formed by the Hindu Kush and Kandahar. Many of the princes and others who had fled from Central Asia and taken shelter at the court of Muhammad Tughlaq may have thought that it was a good opportunity to oust the Mongols from the area. After a year and following the failure of the experiment of establishing a token currency and improvement of relations with the Mongols, the army was disbanded. Disband. I mean, while the situation in Central Asia changed rapidly, in due to course, Timur united the entire area under his control and posed a fresh threat to India. The effects of the Kushran project should not be exaggerated or confused with the Kwarachu expedition. This expedition was launched in the Kumahan Hills in the Himalayas, though, according to a modern historian, the expedition was aimed at Kashmir in order to control the entry of horses from the Chinese side, that is Xinjiang. However, 
it never aimed at the conquest of china as some later historians have suggested after some success the armies went too far into the inhospitable region of the himalayas and suffered a disaster we are told that from an army of 10000 only a only 10 persons returned however it seems that the hill rajas accepted the overlordship of delhi subsequently mahmud tughlaq undertook an expansion in the kaling kangra hills also thus the hill regions were fully secured agrarian reforms in nobility mahmud tughlaq undertook a number of measures uh, measures to improve agriculture most of these were tried out in the dob region mahmud tughlaq did not believe in alauddin khilji's policy of trying to reduce the goods and mukadams headmen in the villages to the position of ordinary cultivators but he did not uh, he did want an advocate share of of the land revenue for the state the measures he advocated had a long term impact but they failed disastrously during his reign it is difficult to see whenever the the measures failed because of bad planning or faulty implementation by officials who lacked experience right at the beginning of mahmud tughlaq's reign there was a serious a peasant rebellion in the gangetic top peasants fled the villages and mahmud tughlaq took harsh measures to capture and punish them historians are of the opinion that the trouble started due to over assessment although the share of the state uh, remained half as in the time of alauddin it was fixed uh, ar- arbitrarily not on the basis of actual produce prices were also fixed artificially for converting the produce into money a severe famine which ravaged the area for a half a dozen years made the situation worse efforts at relief by giving advances for cattle and seeds and for digging wells came too late so many people died in delhi that the air became pestilent here the sultan left delhi and for two and a half years lived in a camp called swargadwari 100 miles from delhi on the banks of the gangas and near kanauj after returning to delhi Mahmud Tughlaq launched a scheme to extend and improve cultivation in the dob. He set up a separate department called Diwan I Amir I Kohi. The area was divided into developments blocks headed by an official whose job was to extend the cultivation by giving loans to the cultivators and induce them to cultivate superior crops wheat in place of barley, sugarcane in place of wheat, grapes and dates in place of sugarcane etc. This scheme failed largely because the men chosen for the purpose proved to be inexperienced and dishonest and misappropriated the money for their own use. The large sums of money advanced for the project could not be recovered. Fortunately for all concerned, Mahmud Tughlaq had died in the meantime and Firoz wrote off the loans. But the policy advocated by Mahmud Tughlaq for extending and improving cultivation was not lost. it was taken up by firoz and even more vigorously later on by akbar another problem which mohammed tughlaq had to face was the problem of the nobility with the downfall of the chahalgani turks and the rise of the khiljis the nobility was drawn from muslims belonging to different races including indian converts mohammed tughlaq went a step further he entertained people who did not belong to noble families but belonged to castes such as barbers cooks weavers wine makers etc he even gave them important offices most of these were the descendants of the muslim converts though a few hindus were also included there is no reason to believe that these people were uneducated or or were inefficient in their jobs but the office holders of the earlier period who were the descendants of old noble families deeply resented it the historian barani makes this a main point in his denunciation of mahmud tughlaq mahmud tughlaq also welcomed foreigners to the nobility a large number of whom came to his court thus the nobility of mahmud tughlaq consisted of many divergent sections and no sense of cho- cohesion could develop among them 
nor any sense of loyalty towards the sultan on the other hand the vast extent of the empire provided favorable opportunities for rebellion and for striving to carve out independent spheres of authority the hot and hasty temperature temper temperament of mohammed tughlaq and his uh, tendency to give extreme punishments to those whom he suspected of opposition or disloyalty strengthened the strength thus the region of mohammed bin tughlaq while marking the zenith of the delhi sultanate also saw the beginning of the process of its uh, integration disintegration decline and disintegration of the delhi sultanate feroz and his successors during the later half of mohammed tughlaq's reign there were repeated rebellions in different parts of the empire rebellions by ambitious nobles particularly in any outlying areas were not a new feature in most cases the sultans had been able to suppress them with a the help of the central army and a band of loyal nobles mohammed tughlaq's difficulties were several the rebellions took place one after another in different parts of the empires in bengal in mabhar tamil nadu in varangal in kampili karnataka in west bengal in avadh and in gujarat and sin mohammed tughlaq did not trust anyone at least not sufficiently so he dashed from one part of the country to the other of to suppress the rebellions and were out his armies the rebellions in south india were the most serious at first the rebellions in these areas were organized by the local governors the sultanate hurried to south india after some time plug broke out in the army we are told that two thirds of the army perished in this uh, plague this was a blow from which mohammed tughlaq could never recover soon after the return of the sultan from south india there was another rebellion there led by two brothers harihara and bukka they set up a uh, principality which gradually expanded this was the vijayanagara empire which soon embraced the entire south further north in the deccan some foreign nobles set up a principality near daulatabad which expanded into the bahmani empire we shall trace the achievements of these two remarkable empire in a subsequent chapter bengal also became independent with a great effort mohammed tughlaq was able to quell the rebellions in avadh gujarat and sind while still in sind mohammed tughlaq died and was succeeded by his cousins firuz tughlaq Muhammad Tughlaq's policies had created deep discontent among the nobles as well as in the army. He had also clashed with Muslim theologians and the Sufi saints who were very influential. But the unpopularity of Muhammad Tughlaq should not be exaggerated. Even when he was away from the capital for long periods, the administration in Delhi, the Punjab and other parts of the empire in North India continued to function normally. After his accession Firuz Tughlaq was faced with the problem of preventing the imminent breakup of the Delhi Sultanate he adopted a policy of trying to appease the nobles the army and the theologians and of asserting his authority over only such areas that could be easily administered from the center he therefore made no attempt to reassert his authority over south india and the deccan He led two campaigns into Bengal but was unsuccessful in both Bengal was thus lost to the sultanate even then the sultan sultanate continued to be as large as it was during the early years of the reign of Alauddin Khilji Firuz led a campaign against the ruler of Jajnagar Odisha he desecrated the temples there and gathered a rich plunder but me no attempt to annex odisha he also led a campaign against the kangra in the punjab hills his longest campaigns were to deal with the rebellions in gujarat and tata although the rebellions were crushed the army suffered great ha- hardship due to losing its way in the run of kutch 
Thus, Firuz was by no means a distinguished military leader, but his reign was a period of peace and offered quite a development. He decreed that uh, whenever a noble died, his son should be allowed to succeed to his position, including his ikta. And if he had no son, his son-in-law, and in his absence, his slave Firuz abolished the practice of whom. torturing nobles and their officials if any balance was found against the matter the time of auditing the accounts of their ikta these steps pleased the nobles and was a major factor in the absence of rebellions by the nobles with a minor exception of one in gujarat and in tata however in the long run the policy of making officers and ikta hereditary was bound to be harmful it reduced the chance of competent men being recruited into the service outside a small circle and made the sultan dependent on the narrow oligarchy fedos extended the principle of hereditary to the army as well all soldiers were allowed to rest in peace and to send in their place their sons or sons in law and if they were not available their slaves the soldiers were not paid in cash but by assignments on the land revenue of villages this meant that the soldier either had to go to the villages to collect his salary and absent himself from service or to give the assessment to some middleman who would give him half or one third of its value thus the soldier did not benefit in the long run the entire military administration became lax and soldiers were allowed to pass useless horses at the master bhai bribing the clerks in a mistaken view of generosity the sultan himself once gave money to a soldier to bribe the clerk of the master firoz tried to win over the theologians by proclaiming that he was a true muslim king and that the state under him was a truly islamic state actually right from the time of iltutmishr accession to the throne there was a tussle between the orthodox theologians and the sultans regarding the nature of the state and the policy to be adopted by the state towards the non muslims as has been stated earlier from the time of iltutmishr the especially under alauddin and muhammad the tughlaq the turkish rulers did not allow the theologians to dictate the policy of the state they waged jihad against the hindu rulers whenever it was convenient for them to do so in order to keep the theologians satisfied a number of them were appointed to high officials the judiciary and the educational system of course remained in the hands of the theologians despite outer trappings and appearance firoz followed Uh, followed the policy of his uh, predecessors in essentials there is no reason to believe that uh, he allowed the theologians to dictate the state policy but he gave a number of important co- concessions to the theologians he tried to ban practices which the orthodox theologians considered un islamic thus the thus he prohibited the practice of muslim women going out to worship at the grave of graves of saints he persecuted a number of muslim sects which were considerable her- heretical uh, heretical by the theologians it was during the time of firuz that uh, jizya became a separate tax earlier it was a part of land revenue firuz refused to exempt the brahmans from the payment of jizya since this was not provided for in the sharia only women children the disabled and the indigent who had no means of livelihood were exempt from it words he publicly burnt a brahman for preaching to the people including muslims on the ground that it was against the sharia on the same ground he even ordered that uh, the beautiful wall paintings in his palace by palace be erased however he patronized music and despite his orthodoxy was fond of mind These narrow views of Firuz Tughlaq were recently certainly harmful. Sorry, the narrow views of Firuz Tughlaq were certainly harmful. At the same time, Firuz Tughlaq was the first ruler who took steps to have Hindu religious works 
ट्रांसलेटेड फ्रॉम सांस्कृत इन टू पर्शियन सो दैट देयर मे बी ए बेटर अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ हिंदू आइडियाज एंड प्रैक्टिस मैनी बुक्स ऑन म्यूजिक मेडिसिन एंड मैथमेटिक्स वर ऑल्सो ट्रांसलेटेड फ्रॉम सांस्कृत इन टू पर्शियन ज्यूरिंग हिज रीजन फिर ऑल्सो टू के नंबर ऑफ ह्यूमेटेरियन मिजर्स ही भारत इन ह्यूमन पनिशमेंट सच इज कटिंग ऑफ हैंड्स फीट फीट नोज एक्सेट्रा फॉर थेफ्ट एंड अदर ऑफेंसेज ही सेटअप हॉस्पिटल फॉर फ्री ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ द पोर एंड ऑर्डर द कोर्ट वॉल्स टू मेक लिस्ट ऑफ अनएम्प्लॉयड पर्सनस ही प्रोवाइडेड डाउरीज फॉर द डॉक्टर्स ऑफ द पोर इट इज लाइकली दैट दीज मेजर्स फॉर बेसिकली डिजाइन टू हेल्प मुस्लिम्स ऑफ होम गुड फैमिलीज हु हैड फॉलन ऑन हार्ड टाइम्स दिस अगेन शोज द लिमिटेड नेचर ऑफ द स्टेट इन इंडिया ज्यूरिंग मेडिवल टाइम्स हाव एवर फिरोज डिड एम्पज emphasized that the state was not meant merely for awarding punishments and collecting taxes but was a benevolent institutions as well in the context of medieval times the assertion of this principle of benevolence was a valuable one and firuz deserves credit for it firuz was keenly interested in the economic improvement of the country he set up a large department of public works which looked after his buildings program Firuz repaired the repaired and dug a number of canals the longest canal was about 200 kilometers which took off from the river satlas to hansi another canal took off from the yamuna these and other canals were meant for irrigation purposes and also for providing water to some of the new towns which firuz built these towns hisar firuz shah or hisar in modern haryana and firuzabad in modern uttar pradesh exist even today and this said another step which firuz took was both economic and political in nature he gave an order that uh, whenever his officials attacked a place they should select handsome and well born young boys and send them to the sultan as slaves in this way firuz gradually gathered about 180000 slaves some of these he trained for carrying on various handicrafts and posted them in the royal workshops karkanas all over the empire from other he formed a crop of soldiers who would be directly dependent on the sultan and hence he hoped would be completely loyal to him the policy was not a new one as we have seen the early turkish sultans in india and followed the practice of recruiting slaves but experience had shown that uh, these slaves could not be dependent on for their loyalty to the descendants of their master and that they soon formed a separate interest group apart from the nobility when firuz died in 1388 the administrative and political problems which had to be faced after the death of every sultan came to the surface the struggle for power between the sultan and the nobles started once again the local zamindars and rajas took advantages of uh, the situation to assume independence a new factor in this situation was the active intervention of the firuz slaves and their attempt to put their own nominee on the throne sultan mohammed son of firuz was able to stabilize his position with their help but one of his uh, first steps was to break up the power of the slaves killing and imprisoning many of them and scattering the rest however neither he nor his successor nasiruddin mohammed who ruled from 1394 to 1412 could control the ambitious nobles and the intransigent rajas perhaps the major reason for this was the reforms of firuz which had made the nobility too strong and the army inefficient the governors of provinces became independent and gradually the sultan of delhi was confined virtually to a small area surrounding delhi as a wit said the domination the dominion of the lord of the universe being the title of the sultans of delhi extends from delhi to palam the weakness of the delhi sultanate was made even worse by timur's invasion of delhi 1398 timur who was a turk but could claim a blood relationship with the changis had started his career of conquest in 1370 and gradually brought under his rule the entire tract from syria to trans oxiana and from southern russia to the indus 
the raid into india was a plundering raid and its motive was to seize the wealth accumulated by the sultans of delhi over the last 200 years with the collapse of the delhi sultanate there was no one to meet this incursion timur's army mercilessly sacked and plundered the various towns on the way to delhi timur then entered delhi and sacked it without mercy large number of people both hindu and muslim as well as women and children lost their lives timur's invention once again showed the dangers facing weak government in the country it resulted in the drain of large amounts of large amounts of wealth gold silver jewelry etc from india timur also took with him a large number of indian artisans such as masons stone cutters carpenters etc some of them helped him in putting up many fine buildings in his capital samarkand he had adopted a similar policy in the case of many iranian towns he had captured but the direct political effect of timur's invasion of india was small the invasion of timur may however be regarded as marking the end of the phase of strong rule by the delhi sultans although the tughlaq dynasty itself lingered until 1412 the responsibility for the disintegration of the delhi sultanate cannot be ascribed to any one ruler we have seen that there were some persistent problems during medieval times such as the relations between the monarch and the monarch and the nobles the conflict with the local rulers and zamindars the pull of regional and geographical factors etc individual rulers tried to cope with these problems but none of them was in a position to effect fundamental changes in society to offset these uh, perennial factors perennial factors disintegration of the political fabric was thus just beneath the surface and any weakness in the central administration set off a chain of events leading to political disintegration feroz was able to contain the chain reactions which had set in due to the over extension of the empire under jia suddin and muhammad tughlaq he instituted a series of reforms aimed at appeasing the nobles and the soldiers which however weakened the central missionary of administration as we have seen the period from 1200 to 1400 saw many new features in india life with the system of government changes in the life and condition of the people and the development of art and architecture these will be the subject of another chapter thank you